Hello, and welcome to the final episode of the Resilient Leadership Learning from Crisis podcast. I'm Seth Schultz, the Executive Director of the Resilient Shift. Back in April, we started speaking to 12 senior decision makers in city government and large global organizations on a weekly basis and understand how they're operating in an environment of uncertainty brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. Over 22 episodes of this podcast, you've heard Peter Willis and me discuss insights from these conversations. For our final episode, we look to the future. Today, you'll hear Peter and me in conversation with two very special guests, Christiana Figueres and Tom Rivet Karnak. Together, they led the delivery of the historic Paris Climate Agreement in 2015, which is currently celebrating its fifth anniversary. Over the last couple of years, they've co-hosted the Outrage and Optimism podcast that highlights how to channel the outrage on the streets towards a stubborn optimism to address the climate crisis. We talked about the value of deep listening as the world responds to the climate crisis and discussed two of our big questions around the future of leadership for resilience. I hope you find this conversation just as inspirational and insightful as we did. Let's jump right into it. Really excited to be here today. As, as we had been uh, indicating, we were going to do an end of the year podcast roundup. And we are absolutely delighted to have some really special friends uh, of ours. And, uh, and they probably need no introduction whatsoever. But we have Tom Karnak and Christiana Figueres. Welcome both. Wait, 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 Seth. Tom for podcasting. I've Tom been wants to be known. Tom Rivet Karnak. <laughs> yes, that's the way he likes to be known, at least in the podcasting world. So, so I have come out of the closet, and it's true. I have a double-barreled name, so I'm just trying to, you know, embrace myself and the reality. So, thank you. Yeah. I I I, I am so sorry, Tom. To let me use your correct <laughs> professional name. Tom Rivet Karnak, delighted to have there you, you join, Peter Willis and myself. Um, so uh, where are you guys joining us from today? So I'm in wild and wonderful Costa Rica, overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And Tom is uh, on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. Actually, if we look very, very, very closely, we can see each other across the Pacific. <laughs> very long way. So I'm in, I'm in the west of England, where I've been locked down with my family. I haven't been anywhere, like most people, for about the last nine months, with the exception that I went to Costa Rica about three weeks ago, which felt very illegal, honestly, you know. You know, when it's not clear that you can go to the corner shop, it felt very sneaky to make my way all the way to Costa Rica. But it was wonderful. And so I spent a week with Christiana talking about strategy, how we're going to change the world next year, and got to look at the ocean that I've only seen up until now through Zoom. And I have to say, Christiana and I obviously talk all the time, and sometimes we're speaking, and then she shouts something like, oh my God, whales, and then runs outside with the camera and tries to point the camera at the ocean so I can see the whales migrating through the bay, which is one of the most disappointing experiences. I mean, if you love whales and nature as I do, and then you're trying to engage via a grainy Zoom picture, I'm glad they're there. But in all honesty, you know, I'm kind of glad that migration has moved on. Anyway. Well, they're, do they're just photobombing us on Zoom. They're photo you know, that's all they're doing. I had no idea we had such similar parallel lives. So I've been talking over the course of the year to Peter. And Peter is in Cape Town and literally we're talking and he's, you know, oh, I just got back from my swim in the sea or, oh, there's a pot of dolphins and penguins. I'm, really? Seriously? Uh, I feel your pain. I feel Unbelievable. Your pain. <laughs> well, we, um, we just had a lovely chat um, just, just before and, and uh, Peter and I were getting to, to, to catch you guys up on the project that we've been running um, this year. Um, and all the insights and the rich, richness with which we gained from it. And Peter and I were really excited to, to kind of share some of those insights with you, but also to kind of ask you about your thoughts and reflections of that process. Because in, in a way, you know, it's been really profound for me to see the power of listening. And if there's a difference between hearing and listening, right? And to actually just give the pe people the space and the trust to talk about what they're afraid of, to talk about uh, what they should be talk dealing with, and to have something just be natural and unscripted. And the power of that was profound. And, you know, we have to thank Peter for that. Peter kind of quarterbacked every single one of these calls and, and created that trust. And then, as you know, he and I would do a roundup of all the conversations on a weekly basis in our podcast. But it just struck me as so similar to what I've heard you guys talk about in your time at the UNFCCC. So 
any initial reflections from both of you on, on what Peter and I were telling you about the project and kind of the experiment we ran over the last uh, six months? Well, um, first of all, if I can, if I can jump in, Tom, um, congratulations on these 16 weeks, which sound like uh, a very rich experience for you both, but also for everyone else who participated. And as you were explaining to us what you did, I thought, hmm, we used to uh, know what reality TV was. This is like reality podcast. <laughs> uh, it's, the, it's the podcast version of reality TV. Um, and, uh, and, and interesting, right? Very interesting because I was in my mind comparing the two forms and perhaps because the visual doesn't accompany the podcast, uh, you are more intent on communicating with words. Um, because the visual is just not there to to help you out. So I can imagine that these conversations were um, were very rich conversations. To your listening, I totally agree that hearing is not the same as listening. I would actually add an adjective to listen, which I think appropriately describes what you have been doing, and that is deep listening. Because We can listen sort of, you know, with half our brain, uh, but deep listening with the full brain and especially with an open heart, that is a different quality of listening. And my sense is that that is the kind of listening that you've been doing. And what what is just so beautiful about that listening is that it is such a gift for both parties. It is a gift for he or she who is deep listening because you're on the receiving end of you know what what the soul the heart and the brain of the other person is willing to share but it is also such a gift for the person who is sharing because as you were pointing out before we started recording that very few people are listened to very few people feel heard feel listened to Very few people um, experience the luxury of someone else taking the time, time being our scarcest resource in our life, taking the time to truly listen with an open heart and an open mind. Um, And especially to do so in the way that I can imagine that you Mm. did, which is take off our own shoes and put on the shoes of the person that we're listening to. And truly, truly trying to understand where they're coming from, what motivates that person. And and I must say that obviously there were many, what some people are calling hard skills that we um that we engaged in uh in the road to Paris. For me, anyway, the most powerful soft skill was the deep listening. Um, the fact that we traveled to almost every country in the world mostly with questions, not to tell them what we wanted them to do, not to tell them what we thought they had to do, but rather with questions and listening, deep listening to understand where they're coming from. It just opens a common ground that is not there if you're not listening. And so I would just add to that and I would actually encourage you to share something else Christiana because it really feels like it resonates for me I remember when I first joined you at the UN and you were talking particularly to developing countries who felt like they were victims they felt like this is this was fundamentally unfair and they were victims to something that had happened around them and that was beyond their control and that was going to visit these terrible outcomes on them And I remember what you did at the time that I I noticed as remarkable, even when we were living through it, is what you did was not try and persuade them that they weren't victims, but you recognized the way in which you had sometimes thought of yourself as a victim as well. And then you met that trauma in them. And I think that was what made them feel that they were seen throughout this process. Yeah, it is. um, It was one of the most powerful, um, I guess, personal growth experiences, because we're so used to thinking that another person's experience is that person's experience. And if we do really um, engage in deep listening, we very quickly realize that fundamentally we're all humans and that the 
thoughts, the emotions, the fears, the anxiety, the grief that another person um, feels is somewhere inside of us also, perhaps with a different colored coat, perhaps in a different language, perhaps in a different geography, but the sentiment is there because it's a human sentiment and it may have been provoked by a different circumstance or a different experience in life, but it's there. And so when someone is sharing out of their grief, if we very intentionally feel where that grief is in us and begin to get in touch with that and in fact even heal that within ourselves without asking the other person to do the the internal work for us because each of us are responsible for our own internal work. But it just gives that experience with the other person a completely different quality because you meet vulnerability to vulnerability. You hold hands in your mutual vulnerability. And once you have done that with another human being, the quality of that relationship moves to a completely different level. And then on, you can have, you know, whatever, technical discussions about megatons or whatever you want. But the root, the deep root is there. What you're saying resonates so much. And it's, it's kind of interesting that I find myself surrounded by what I would call expert listeners. Um, I'm not. I'm not an expert listener. I'm a talker. And I have to constantly remind myself to not talk as much and to let other people speak. So I recognize what you're saying, Christiana, in this exercise that we've just done, because I've seen the power of what happens when you give that other person the time and the attention to be seen and to be heard. And, and what you did a roundup from all of our participants afterwards asking you know, what did you learn from this? What did you like about this? And they said almost the exact same things you did. We found it profoundly meaningful to, to actually have time carved out from a very hectic schedule to be heard and to listen and then to hear thoughts from other people. Um, and I think, you know, we're, we're very lucky that we had Peter in this. I mean, Peter was an instrumental role in this because he is that expert listener and he created that safe space, which allowed um, similar to, to conversations that you were just sharing that you've had in the past, that it enabled that to happen. But a big focus of all of this for us while we were doing it was to understand leadership. What, what happens during leadership in a crisis? How can you learn from that and how can you develop? And again, picking up on another point that you just mentioned, what came through loud and clear was vulnerability. And it's interesting because in society now, right, we don't reward leaders for being human or being vulnerable. We reward them for being made out of Teflon uh, and to having perfectly parsed, tweetable, quotable statements. Um, and they've got it all figured out. And what was so fascinating is that under the umbrella of such a s severe pandemic, it allowed everybody to just drop that mantle. How can you have it all figured out when we've never seen anything like this happen? And it, as a result, it created, I think, more willingness to be candid and to be vulnerable. And that vulnerability and leaning into the unknown and the uncertainty became profound. And it was a door with which we could travel through and have a conversation with these leaders around the world and understanding vulnerability, understanding, engaging, and that leadership comes from many different places, not just the C-suite. It comes from people at all levels of an organization, both and both within and outside of your organization. And that ended up being a very profound process for us. And, and maybe, Peter, if I could turn it over to you, because as we've been thinking about the leadership components of what we distilled, we we came up with a couple of key questions, I think three kind of distillations around leadership that, uh, that we wanted to talk to Tom and Christian about. So maybe I could turn it over to you to, to walk us through some of those key insights and questions. The, this only, these three questions only really surfaced uh, as uh, I was doing the first draft of the report. They, they literally just sort of stood up and looked at me. The one was, I'll read it to you here, what might be missing from our senior leadership that youth could supply? And what might be missing from aspiring leaders of the future that experienced leaders could provide? And that, one, that particular one was inspired by three of our younger team members and, uh, working on the, in, the, in the back room of the project, who when we got together as a, all the participants and the backroom team, one of them said, do you know what? I just want to say that reading the transcripts and listening to your recorded conversations every week was an extraordinary experience because I'm an aspiring leader. She got an MBA and so on. And listening to these senior leaders all admitting 
for not knowing this, just being so human. She said, that is a revelation. When have I ever seen that in my working life? And it really got us thinking that there, is, that there isn't an easy bridge between experienced leadership and the ones coming through. There are obviously some, some formal bridges, but how do they get to see that vulnerability and that hu human dimension of these senior experienced leaders? So that was the one. Another was um, came out of the diversity that we that Seth referred to um, between the cities and the, the corporates who were involved. What might happen if the leaders of cities and corporations stood in each other's shoes from time to time, in between facing crises together? Right, that goes right back to Christiana's point about step standing in that somebody else's shoes for that understanding and listening. It, it's eerie how well that aligned. Yeah. And the third one was about the listening. So what if our big influential organizations were to give strategic importance to the subtle transformative art of listening? And I just want to say, Christiana, listening to you recalling the work you did prior to Paris, I thought, wow, what if more of our leaders had that in their strategic toolkit and, and their capabilities? Because you obviously have an extraordinary capability to to do that kind of listening while carrying with you the technical conversation as well. And look at the results you achieved. But that's the question we're sitting with now is how do we take this to a next level of scale? You you just told us a story of scale, if you like, which obviously involved a lot of a lot of air miles and a lot of getting getting inside the space of very senior leaders with huge agendas that they needed to deliver on. But that is the real world we have to try and unlock. So any thoughts and reflections on those three kind of key questions that have emerged on our side, how, whether they resonate with you or not, um, any suggestions and, and or how they've emerged in the conversations you've been having on outrage and optimism or in the broader work that you're doing at uh, Global Optimism? Just a few reflections and then Christiana will, will jump in, obviously. It's a great point around the visibility of vulnerability and how actually that is leadership, right? If you're not prepared to have any vulnerability on show, then you're just putting on a show of some kind because we all know what it is to be human and the fact that humans doubt ourselves and humans are sort of insecure in many ways. And so we face some of those things, but it's become habitual to do it in private. And what you put your finger on there is that that is a huge disservice to the future. One interesting but obvious point that struck me as you were talking is uh, the mantle of, of, of authentic leadership is, is really um, not being well filled at this critical moment. Now, there's this new hope at the moment because Trump has provided this model of leadership that obviously has been so poisonous. And there's this new hope that, that might shift. But that we're now coming after a U.S. election that has captivated the world in which there was no dialogue at all. There were two completely separate groups that had no way of talking to each other. They didn't have shared language. They certainly didn't have vulnerability. And nothing was rewarded in terms of outreach. We've created these two opposing poles. That can only be softened through courage and through vulnerability. But it's very difficult for that system to start to heal itself. So actually, that mantle of authentic leadership has to be decentralized and bottom up. And that's probably how that system is going to change. So that's on all of us, right, in day-to-day -day leadership roles, to exhibit that way of being, that deep listening, that engaging. I mean, some of the most satisfying work I've ever done is, is, is through Leaders Quest, who many people may know. And we've been to West Virginia and down coal mines and into prisons and, to, you know, all over the world and to the West Bank and Jerusalem and had those conversations and engaged in that deep listening with people who may be the other side of these voids. And it's always deeply fulfilling in order to, um, to have those conversations and see what really goes on inside people. The other point I'd just make very quickly is... Um, it's really hard to hate up close. And when you get close to people who have an opposing view of you, then you can't hold on to your preconceptions. And part of what we have really enjoyed in the podcast is we talk to people who would be regarded as the enemy by some elements of the climate movement, CEOs of fossil fuel companies, you know, and, and a range of others. And actually, when you have that, this isn't to say they should be given, you know, this is an emergency. We all need to be doing everything we can to accelerate. But actually, they're trapped by a system that they want to change. No one wants to be on the wrong side of history. They want to do what their, their, their children are looking them in the eye and telling them is needed. 
but they are stuck inside a system over which they only have partial control. And they deserve, not in every case, you know, we need to be judicious, we need to push where necessary, but in more cases than we realize, they deserve our, our partnership and our engagement and our collective work together. And that is that comes from that deep connection and that deep listening to each other. I love it. I mean, how do you top that, Christiana? You don't. Oh, she'll find a way. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you see, that's why we work together, because Tom is so fantastic. I, I guess I guess to complement what Tom has so eloquently shared, there's a certain irony here that um, we think that power and leadership and you know whatever moves the world forward in very traditional ways of thinking has something to do with uh, the title that is on your business card or whatever the nameplate is at your door, wherever you are ranked in society. And the irony about that is that actually the power to change anything has nothing to do with what is on your business card or what is on your nameplate. The power to change resides inside each of us. and. Here is irony, you know, quadrupled. The power comes from putting your finger on your own vulnerability. We are so taught from, you know, the word get go to put our vulnerability in a box, lock it up and don't let it out until we're 99 and about to leave this planet. And we don't realize that is a treasure trove because it is in that vulnerability that you can actually humanize your relationship with everyone else. And if, if your relationship, if your conversations, if what you're trying to do, if, if, if the, the, the power over is something that we should totally throw in the, in the bin, because it's not about power over anything. It's about power for, power for change, power for good, right? Um, and it's not about privilege of having, it's about the privilege of being human beings, that is the major privilege that we all share. And the privilege of being in service of the betterment of humanity. What better privilege do we all have? It's not about the privilege of having this house or that house or this bank account or whatever. That is not true privilege, the privilege that we all share. And that's why there's an abundance of it is about being alive right now, being humans at this incredible moment in time. And so if we can see all of that, and if we can humanize ourselves first by delving into our own vulnerability, because thank heavens, we all have a treasure of vulnerability, right? We all do. And that is where you connect. That is where we connect to each other and are all of a sudden can discover where the power really lies, where the capacity, the, the power to change, where the capacity to improve and to work together is really there. It is not on your business card. You know, we should all throw our business cards away and, and just meet each other for who we are, not for what we are, because what we are only gets in the way, totally gets in the way. If we can actually meet each other and, you know, work hand in hand and walk hand in hand with who we are as humans, we would walk so much faster and farther. If we could just bottle the two of you up and keep us with you all the time, it would be fantastic. But uh, I guess I guess what we'll have to do is just keep listening to the great work that you already are doing. And again, I, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier at the top or not, but thanks so much for the information uh, the inspiration, rather, to, to embark on this journey ourselves. And we really didn't know what we were doing. And, and it's been incredibly rewarding uh, to discover what you guys have already learned in your processes uh, about how to meet each other, to listen, and and to lean into the vulnerability that is really the cornerstone of of resilience. Um, it's been it's been remarkable for us and, and the participants. And, and we've learned a lot, too, from the team that also built this. So you met a couple of them today. Uh, there's been many more, and, and Peter had mentioned some of the insights that we gained from their reflections of doing all the work in the background. Because having a younger 
and and potentially smarter generation of people who were taking all the transcripts of our recordings, you know, simplifying them, codifying them, pulling out the information and nuggets, distilling this and feeding it back into the podcast. They ended up creating all of this insights and information themselves. And then what they fed back to us about what they thought, you know, from their eyes was interesting, was really quite eye opening. So, but I guess maybe that's where, that's where I kind of wanted to end a little bit is um, as we're kind of nearing sadly on, on our time, I guess from your perspective, and I love this turn of phrase that Peter had used the other day when we were getting ready to talk with you guys. He, he said that from up there in the global climate change cockpit with deep experience um, of what you've done and what we've heard about um, and bearing in mind what a crazy year we've just had and what a huge year next year is in the lead up to COP26 in Glasgow. A lot of people forget that this was the ratcheting up process that you guys had laid out five years ago. Now that's pushed off to next year. Yes, in one way bad because it's pushed off. Another way terrific because it gave everybody that much more time to think about this. And COVID has having some profound, I think, uh, impacts on what that might look like. So perhaps, I guess Peter and I were very interested in understanding what the two of you would most want us to do with what we have begun to uncover and learn ourselves and how we might uh, use this approach in trying to create a global shift in terms of understanding and implementation of resilience through listening and reflective learning in a, in a way that might support and serve kind of the worldwide movement that you have been so passionately working towards. Well, first of all, I, I, I think the analogy is very cute cockpit um, of climate change, but um, it's not the way it feels because we don't feel that we are sort of up there and everybody else is down there, you know, in the weeds. We we hope that we're as in the weeds uh, as everyone else and doing doing our bit here in a collaborative way. Having said that, your question is, where do we go from here, basically? And, and I think the answer to that is what we've been talking about, right? Yes, we will still have to measure. Yes, we will still have to um, have transparency and accounting and agreements and implementation and renewable energy targets and energy efficiency targets and all of that. We all we have to have all of that because otherwise we don't really know whether we're moving forward or not. And this year has been an extraordinary year in the sense that we have reduced uh, the equivalent of greenhouse gas emissions. 8% this year, apparently, that we should reduce every other year until 2030 if we want to make the target of being at one half current emissions by 2030. However, this is not the way we want to decarbonize the economy. This year has been, ironically, fantastic for the natural environment because we've seen the natural environment really pop back in as soon as we have diminish the stress that and the pressure that we humans put on the natural environment. And that reduction emissions and that re-resilience, if you will, of nature has to be achieved without the 2020 human misery. That cannot be the price that we pay. And so that's the challenge, right? How do we chart the path from now, certainly until 2030, but beyond, but now is the immediate decisive decade. How do we chart the path toward a nature that we deliberately and intentionally regenerate soils, waters, forests, land, that we deliberately regenerate as we actually move to a thriving human economy that has more jobs, better jobs, more health, better economic stability. We have to get those, those straight. And we're beginning to move in that direction. I think that's the exciting part that we're beginning to see that those two things are not at odds with each other. They actually are part and parcel of each other. But we have, we, we have to, over the next, let's say, 12 months, move those separate experiences or pro projects that are piloting that concept into the normalizing path. We have to be able to normalize that experience for everyone because that is what is going to get us to speed and scale and to move beyond 
the fact that we can list out, you know, if we look at a list, we can list out at which companies are doing a great job or which financial institutions or which countries. We, that list should disappear because everyone is doing the right thing. So how do we go from very good examples from exceptional leadership to normalization and uh, to the, the normalization of the actions and of the, um, of the leadership? To me, that's the, that's the challenge ahead. And what better to do that than to recognize that the common platform that we all share for normalizing this is our humanity to bring this back, right? And that it is all of our jobs, not just the darn cockpit people. It is all of our jobs to do this. There's no one that is exempted of responsibility or of the incredible opportunity to do this. That's the cool thing. That's what I find exciting, is that every single one can and should and must put in their little grain of sand. And all the little grains of sand are gonna be different. That's fine. But everyone can actually collaborate on that. That's what I think is so exciting. Fantastic, Christiana. Thank you so much. I love that. I mean, and I, I don't think I've got anything to add. I mean, the only thing I would I would share, just I which I think is what Christiana said already, is that um, you know, we've kind of got this last chance to do this. And we know, right, that if we don't do this in this decade, that in 10 years time, we will have begun to lose control of the climatic system and it will begin to matter less and less whether we do anything after that. And the impacts of that will be permanent on any time scale that has any meaning for humanity. So we have this very rare moment where we are living through a consequential moment in history and we know we're living through it. Most consequential moments in history are only visible in the rear view mirror. And you look back afterwards and you hope you showed up with courage and integrity and purpose, but you don't know till afterwards. Now we get to choose. We get to choose who we want to be in this consequential decade. And that comes from bringing all of ourselves to this transformation, right? All of our messy vulnerabilities, all of the human elements of it, that's what it's gonna take. We can't bluff our way through this. We need to show up. We need to decide that we're gonna be part of the solution. We need to come at it with courage and determination and have fun while we're doing it, right? Who, who gets to do this? Who gets to say, I lived through the greatest transformation in human history and played my part and made it come out on the right side? That's who we get to be. And we should celebrate that privilege every day. There is a, a wonderful quote, which I would just very quickly like to end with, and I'm going to try and share it with you. It's my favorite thing. It's from Tom Stoppard. He says, it makes me so happy to be here at the beginning again, knowing almost nothing. A door like this has cracked open maybe five or six times since we got up on our hind legs. It's the best possible time to be alive when everything you thought you knew is wrong. Oh, that is fantastic. I just adore you both so much. And thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to come and listen to us and, and our own journey and experiment of, of what we're trying to do to help. And it just meant the world to us that you, you joined us and uh, shared, shared some of your insights and wisdom. And they were as fantastic as we had hoped. Thank you both very much. And to your, and to your backroom team, because we know how, we know who really does all the hard work is the backroom team. So thank you to them also. Thanks so much. All right, guys. Nice to see you. Bye. Bye guys. That's a wrap on the last episode of the Resilient Leadership Podcast. We couldn't end without thanking you, our dear listeners, for sticking with us through this crazy experiment. I hope listening to Peter, me, and all of our guests has given you valuable insights to navigate this challenging year. If you'd like to revisit our journey together, our back catalog of episodes is always available in your podcast stream. And make sure you download our project report. You'll find a link in the episode notes. This is Seth Schultz signing off for one last time on behalf of The Resilient Shift. We hope we meet again soon.